Uh, thank you, Honorable Speaker. As you're aware, over the period of uh, 16th to 31st of August of this year, I had opportunity to visit the U.S. Uh, with your kind support, Honorable Speaker. And during that uh, period, I had opportunity to engage with Kenyans living in the U.S., in the cities of Chicago, Seattle, Washington, D.C., and Houston. And it is the genesis of these questions that I've posed to the Cabinet Secretary for Foreign Affairs out of my interaction with the Kenyans and including our diplomats at the Kenyan Embassy in Washington, D.C. Honorable Speaker, unfortunately, as I speak, I have not received the hard copy responses, but I hope the Secretariat is making arrangements. So I'm not aware whether the, the CS has actually put in written responses. But uh, these are the questions, Honorable Speaker, and I will read the three of them. I, I'm sure that the CS can answer all of them at once. The first question to the CS is, could the Cabinet Secretary indicate the staffing levels by CADA at the Kenya Embassy in Washington, D.C., and the two Kenya consulates in Los Angeles and New York, and outline the roles of staff serving in each CADA? Secondly, Honorable Speaker, could the Cabinet Secretary explain how the staffing levels have impacted the operational efficiency of the said diplomatic missions and clarify whether there are any plans to deploy additional staff. Lastly, Honorable Speaker, could the Cabinet Secretary also explain the delay in the issuance of national identity cards to Kenyans residing in the U.S. and state what the Ministry is doing to resolve the issue? I thank you, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Prime Cabinet Secretary, you may proceed. To respond. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, first I would like to state that uh, the hard copy has been released. Maybe it's just a delay uh, to get to you, but it has been signed. Uh, on uh, the first aspect of his question, um, to indicate the staffing levels by CADA at the Kenyan Embassy in Washington, D.C., the two consulates in, uh, consulates in uh, Los Angeles and uh, New York, and then outline the staff, the role of the staff. I wish to say that in the hard copy, in the response I've given, I've tabled the details uh, of the home-based staff uh, indicating the authorized, the impost, and the variance. Uh, I've done the same also for the other agencies. Uh, that is the defense attaché, the education attaché, foreign relations officer, trade attaché, and immigration. So in total, there is uh, an indication. We indicate that uh, the authorized is 17, but we have a deficit, we, uh, and the authorized the impost is 14, so there's a variance of three. Uh, I've also indicated in the permanent um, uh, UN mission, um, I've also indicated that there is an immigration officer attached there uh, as to handle the consulate services. Mr. Speaker, sir, I I have also attached the details of the Los Angeles, again on the same principle, the authorized, the impost, and where there is any variance. Um, clearly, uh, on the LA, um, both the authorized and impost tally, that is a total of seven, uh, as it stands now. I have also tabulated the responsibilities uh, of all these officers, um, Mr. Speaker, it's a long list. Uh, so uh, perhaps it may be necessary for uh, the Honourable Senator to perhaps seek any clarification on, on one or two issues after he looks at that. The second aspect is about the efficiency. Uh, explain how the staffing levels have impacted the operational efficiency of the said diplomatic missions and clarify whether there are any plans to deploy additional staff. Mr. Speaker, definitely staffing levels have a direct influence on operational efficiency. 
by affecting workload distribution, response times, and the overall capacity to manage diplomatic tasks. Therefore, low staffing levels may occasion service deliveries uh, such as delays in processing uh, visas when we are doing the full angle of visas, but we still do it on a limited basis because, as you know, we are also a visa-free uh, country now, but there are still some uh, areas that uh, require visa processing. We have uh, aspects of managing communication and executing policy initiatives. So definitely, it is absolutely essential uh, that uh, proper staffing levels uh, are in situ to avoid uh, delays. The third aspect that uh, I will touch to is the issue of the delay in the issuance of national identity cards to Kenyans residing in the United States of America and what the ministry is doing uh, to resolve this issue. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I would like to point out that the Ministry of Foreign and Diaspora Affairs serves as a facilitator coordinating the issuance of ID cards through the immigration attaches in missions abroad. In this case, identity cards are processed at our embassy in Washington, D.C., which is also in charge of the consulate in New York that processes identity cards for Kenyans in the eastern side of the U.S. and the consulate in L.A. that serves Kenyans on the western side. Uh, Mr. Speaker, some of the challenges we have that have occasioned delays include the following. Issuance of registration on e-citizen, where the system sometimes rejects foreign numbers, where the one-time password has to be sent to the particular phone number used by the for the registration. We are now sensitizing the diaspora to use the email option. B, we have the processing of ID cards is entirely manual and verification of all applications has to be done by the National Registration Bureau. This causes a bit of delay, especially at missions that are not well staffed. In addition, in the event of queries, the request has to be channeled back to the mission to seek clarity uh, from the applicant. I also want to bring to the attention of the Senate that the court case brought against the Maisha number did cause uh, a general delay in identity card processing for both local and international applications. However, since the signing of that court order on 12th August 2024, processing and issuance of ID cards has now resumed normally. Uh, there is also an interesting scenario where some of the applicants have not collected their national identity cards and passports which have been finalized at our missions. As of now, for instance, the immigration in New York has in its storage eight ID cards, which the return mailing address given by the applicants were wrong and had been mailed back to the mission. Uh, emails or calls to the applicants were, could not go through. Therefore, we still hold those IDs. Um, I also would like to point out that uh, through the Rapid Results Initiative by the State Department for Diaspora Affairs, they are, where they, in collaboration with the State Department for Immigration and e-citizens, periodically decentralize their ID processing to other cities away from the embassy or consulates are located. This is undertaken through the mobile consular services outreach exercise, which has seen 2,459 identity cards processed in outstations in Seattle, Atlanta, Minnesota, Dallas, Boston, and Houston. Another phase of this mobile consular services is being planned for the third quarter of the financial year 2024-25. On the issue of the e-citizens and the challenges of the OTP versus foreign cellular numbers, the Principal Secretary for Diaspora Affairs is engaging some of our local telcos on an option of an e-SIM card, which the diaspora can use while away for both e-citizens. In addition, 
the State Department for Diaspora is preparing to deploy officers to support the service provision to the Kenyan diaspora in the three missions in the U.S. Finally, uh, Mr. Speaker, I can, uh, I can say that the, the requirement is tabulated, so it may require further examination. And uh, I just want to assure the House that uh, either now or later, I or my peers, uh, Dr. Singoy, would be happy to offer any written clarification beyond this. Yes, uh, Senator Eden Sifuna, you may ask two supplementary questions. The Honorable Speaker, before I even go to the supplementary questions, I'm wholly disappointed by the quality of the response. Uh, I thought that uh, the full title of the CS for Foreign Affairs also puts him in charge of coordination of other ministries. Surely, if there are issues that are in ministries other than the Foreign Affairs, I know we should direct it to the ministry itself, but being the person in charge of uh, coordination of all the other ministries, I expected a more solid response, Honorable Speaker. Uh, uh, speaker, for instance, uh, the response indicates that uh, there is an ambassador and one in post. Uh, that essentially means there's an ambassador deployed in Washington, D.C. I would want to know when the ambassador reported, because when I was there, the embassy was manned by charged affairs, there was no ambassador. I don't know when he reported. Uh, secondly, Honorable Speaker, you will see the tabulation here. Uh, there is only one trade attaché for an, a country that is as important as the U.S., and I would have expected a discussion on the adequacy. When I was there, I was given an example, Honorable Speaker, a country like Vietnam has four agricultural attaches, indicating the seriousness with which they take their job. I would have expected a discussion about the adequacy of the staff that have been deployed. If you are telling us, Honorable Speaker, that you have one staff uh, uh, in, the, in the consulate in, uh, in, uh, in New York, what happens when that person falls sick? That is why there are all sorts of problems in these consulates, because you cannot have one person manning a station. It, it just doesn't make any sense. So that is the sort of discussion that I had expected, and I have to express my disappointment in the answer so that the cabinet secretary understands what I wanted uh, to, uh, to, to get from him. But in terms of uh, uh, follow-up questions, Honorable Speaker, First of all, uh, the women in the U.S., uh, Honorable C.S., uh, asked me to ask you specifically why it is that since 1963 with the first Kenyan ambassador, Brody Nabuera, up to today, you have never seconded a woman as, a, as the ambassador of Kenya to the U.S. That is a question that the ladies asked me to put to the C.S., and I would be remiss if I did not put it. Maybe there is a thinking within government as to the capacity of women to be deployed in serious postings such as Washington, D.C. Honorable Speaker, secondly, the problem with the delays uh, in the processing of IDs, as the CS himself has uh, uh, alluded to, is that it's a manual process. People have to travel from all across the U.S., a country that is far more vast than, say, the, 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 the EU. And if the CS would compare the deployment of uh, diplomatic staff in the entire European Union, which is smaller in size than the American uh, continent, Honorable Speaker. Uh, these people have to travel from all these far distances, five-hour flights, six-hour flights. Then you come to the embassy and you have to do this manual process as if you are at a DC's office in Kerugoya, Honorable Speaker. And then they are put in a diplomatic bag, they are sent here. There is no special office for processing of diaspora applications for IDs. They are just lumped together with other applications from, say, Kilifi, Bungoma, and Nairobi. And yet there is an office that was created, I think it is a department, on di diaspora affairs. Can the CS shed light on the responsibilities of this office and what, what these people do in the diaspora office, if not just concentrate on these applications and what they are doing to automate the process of uh, processing of identification uh, cards because on the speaker the feedback was that because we have automated the application process and the uh, uh, processing of passports, passports are faster than IDs that are still manual. So what is the plan, uh, Honorable CS, for you to address these challenges to ensure that people get these documents, uh, critical documents in good time? I thank you, Honorable Speaker. Honorable um, Prime Cabinet Secretary, you may proceed to respond, please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. There are quite a number of issues that uh, 
uh, are valid in the concerns that the senator does raise. Um, uh, the first thing that I need to point out is that there's no discrimination against uh, women in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And in fact, as we speak today, I can give you an example that uh, in the UK, the High Commissioner is a lady. Um, I would uh, also want to point out that the ambassador for Kenya in Washington uh, reported uh, two weeks ago. So he's in the uh, station. And this comes, there's a cycle. Uh, ambassadors and officers in missions have a cycle, a tour of duty of about four years. And in the process, uh, the issue of their term expiring, it is staggered, it's not all at the same time. So this would have been a situation where you were visiting when the outgoing uh, was also uh, just preparing to come back or had just left, and that is Ambassador Amayo. So sometimes you are caught up in these cycles between transition, and I would say that that is the reason why maybe you did not meet uh, the Ambassador, but there's an Ambassador as we speak today. Um, I have indicated that uh, the consular uh, services um, through the diaspora affairs did yield about 2,500 uh, IDs uh, in different towns and uh, therefore we'll continue in the efforts to make sure that we reach out. Automation and technology are things we are pursuing within the context of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, in linkage, in, in liaison even with the immigration so that we can improve uh, the services. So the, there are these delays that uh, we hope to navigate through going forward. Finally, Mr. Speaker, uh, it would be a big omission if I did not uh, inform the Senate that one of the challenges that we have faced and we continue to face is actually the resource uh, allocation. And I'll give uh, a very clear example that, for instance, uh, when we lost the finance bill, uh, we have seriously had to do uh, a serious haircut in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, just like other ministries. But uh, when you look at it in the context of uh, uh, the resources that would have been available to make sure that we are seamless in our operations, as of now, let me admit that we are constrained financially, and it is a challenge that is facing the entire country. So we hope that within the context of the next financial year, as we progress, we can improve on the funding of our missions. Senator Mungatana. Asante sana bwana speaker kwa kunipa nafasi hii. Namkaribisha waziri wetu